astigmatism during cataract surgery. And how to get more information about femto cataract surgery. If you are, Do not miss the upcoming informative session in Hole A, where our anterior segment experts will be discussing a patient with corneal astigmatism, 2.5 prism diopters, and plans for cataract surgery. How would you manage this patient? Would you do limbal relaxing incisions? Or will you implant toric intraocular lenses? Or do nothing during surgery and schedule him for LASIK astigmatic correction post cataract surgery? Femto second laser assisted cataract surgery. Is it needed or just a waste of time? How to manage complications during femtosecond laser cataract surgery. And what are available femtosecond cataract surgery platforms? These informative topics will be discussed by our expert panelists, Professor, Professor Francisco, Francisco Corones, Corones, Medical Director of Corones Ophthalmology Center, Milan, Italy. Dr. Mohammed Hisham, Medical Director of Maghrabi Eye Hospital, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Professor, Professor Ahmed, Ahmed Asa, Asa, Cataract and Glaucoma Unit, Ain Shams University, Cairo, Egypt. Dr. Dr. James, James Bacon, Bacon, Chief of Cataract and Glaucoma Unit, Maghrabi Eye Hospital, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. All of our experts will appear during a session moderated, moderated by, by Professor, Professor Jorge, Jorge Alio, Alio, Miguel Hernandez University, Alicante, Spain. Do not miss this upcoming very informative session in, in Hall, Hall A. A. Coming up Coming in, in Hall, Hall A. A. Okay, now my, my role will be to try to defend the position of toric intraocular lenses. Are if you I, interested? If I can. If I can. Okay, after this uh, spectacular introduction, I'm happy to start. <clears throat> and indeed, a cataract surgery today is refractive surgery, and refractive surgery is astigmatism correction. So, may I have my first presentation, presentation number one, please? And toric IOLs have been mentioned as one of the ways to correct astigmatism in cataract surgery. I will tell you why is my preferred method and when I use them, if I can. Anyhow, I want to thank <coughs> all the speakers and moderators. I will repeat them. It's Francesco Carones, my dear friend from Italy, uh, Mohamed Hissam from Dubai, Ahmed Asaf from Cairo, and Jess Bacon from Abu Dhabi, right? May I have my presentation, please? First time is always like this. First presentation in the morning, first session. Okay, just to take a little bit of the time. Well, you, you are aware of the, of the studies that have been performed in different parts of the world about astigmatism. <clears throat> first of all, let me tell you, astigmatism is not happening in all areas of the world within the same proportion. Ethnicity plays a role, and in Caucasian population, it is about, Probably uh, one third of the patients, about 30%, those that have more than 1.5 uh, diopters of astigmatism. This is not my presentation. It's presentation of Dr. Alio, number one. So we should expect to have <clears throat> about 30% of the patients in the need of astigmatism surgery because definitely 1.5 is far more the limit of what is tolerable by a patient, especially if we are thinking in the use of a multifocal premium lens. 
Less than one diopter is, let's say, acceptable for a while, but even one diopter is too much today in today's environment, which would really try to get good vision. And definitely one diopter will interfere with the outcomes of multifocal uh, lenses and should be correct. So your target, and my target indeed, should be to be about 0.5 diopters of astigmatism, coronal astigmatism, and the issue of this session is how to get this as a fact, how to get this, uh, this, this outcome. To get this outcome, you have a, first to analyze your patient, to identify what is the corneal astigmatism. We need to remember that we should correct only corneal astigmatism because intraocular astigmatism, which is indeed the difference between the refractive and the corneal anterior surface, is going to be left uh, uh, untouched by the surgery. This is my presentation. Thank you very much indeed to the IT personnel. And uh, well, now if I can run my presentation, will be... Very good. And then we have the posterior surface of the cornea, which is at, uh, at this moment possible to analyze. The role is about 0.5 diopters, and indeed, if we need to target an accurate outcome, we should consider also the posterior surface of the cornea. So this is the environment of what we are going to do. Indeed, it's true that we have three ways to go to astigmatism following cataract surgery. One is with glasses. The second is with relaxing incisions, or let's say incisional surgery, and the third are toric intraocular lenses. Indeed, uh, glasses are not the, the target of our patients, neither the target of the, those of you that have come to this session. I don't think that this is working. This is not working at all. It's not working. Okay, thank you. This is, well, this is more or less a summary of what I was uh, t telling you. The role of, of astigmatism today is definitely important, especially if you are using multifocal lenses. This is what I mentioned to you. We should target about uh, one third of our patients, about 30%, 1.5 or more. But I am today considering more than one diopter as definitely an indication for astigmatism surgery. And definitely I do astigmatism surgery one or other type in every case with one diopter or more. About incisional refractive surgery is, has been very much promoted along the last two years because of the uh, beginning of femtosecond laser cataract surgery, but whatever you do, incisions of femtosecond is the same. It is the same. Don't be biased by commercial issues. It is unpredictable. Whatever nomogram you use, the nomogram is one thing and what you get is different. That depends a lot of the place of the incision, of the, of the length, on the distance to the limbus, and indeed on the wound healing of the, of the patient and the death. And you have to remember that all these variables are not controlled even by femtosecond cataract surgery. It's true also that the, that the second problem, and is the main one in my opinion, because the first is lack of predictor, but for me it's even more important, the capability of incisions to induce aberrations. This has been demonstrated by us, it's published in several papers from us and confirmed by other authors. You degrade the optical quality of the cornea and sometimes you correct astigmatism at the price of increasing high of the aberrations, which makes it is much worse situation, much, much more difficult to correct, and indeed a challenge the outcome that you will have with multifocal lenses. About the toric lenses is indeed one of the most accurate and more sophisticated ways to correct astigmatism. It's indeed something that is added to the spherical uh, correction. Most, if not all, the technologies today are using the positive meridian as the target for the correction. So you work on the positive meridian in the elimination of the intraocular lens. We have uh, the indications today and this is global and this is a common uh, consensus on this, that 1.5 is from where you have to use uh, the toric lenses. I have to tell you, you have the control of your surgical induced astigmatism. The target for me is one, and indeed you have to follow also some indications. So you have to study the cornea. If this is not for irregular patients, irregular cornea patients that have a large irregularity, because even with the correction of the toricity, you will not get good vision, and you have also so to consider that you have other, all the other reasons of astigmatism coming with the refraction and not the indication you have to study and to work with the anterior corneal surface and to a certain level with the posterior corneal surface as well. 
The stability is what matters because you are implanting a lens with a, in an axis that should be left there and you should plus implant the lens exactly in the meridian. What, uh, what is important is to make a good surgery but also to have a good technology good enough to keep the lens in the place without rotation. You have two reasons uh, 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 now to consider in the stability of the lenses and not all lenses are the same and you will see today uh, two important lenses and they are not looking the same. First of all, you have to control the incision in order not, not to induce or to change the astigmatism. Obviously, if you change the magnitude of the axis of astigmatism, your toric correction will, will be failing. And the second, you have to get this perfect alignment on the lens in the moment of the surgery. It is, uh, this uh, correction is uh, capable today, at least in Western Europe, to, up, to go up to 16 diodes of astigmatism. There are published reports up to 22 diodes. This is a definitely exceptional. And indeed, the most, uh, uh, most of the available designs are uh, fixed in power, even that for special cases that are, of course, not frequent, you can get customized lenses uh, with a uh, with the correction of the toric uh, module as well. The rotational stability is what limits the, 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 the use of these lenses. If a lens is not rotationally stable, it's not going to be useful for correction, and so all these lenses should be definitely made in an adequate material some materials, silicon, for instance, are not suitable for toric corrections. And second, you have to get the lens in the right alineation with the right technique, and the model and the haptics should be stable for the purpose. You have to, to remember, and this is something that is known by most of you, that you have an increased loss of power according with misalignment. Misalignment is when it reaches 33%. It makes a total loss of the power of the lens, while a correction of, of, a, of three or to five degrees makes significant losses and under correction that are coming from 0.5 to one diopters. So alignment is important. I do my alignment still today clinical. I mark at the slit lamp in the 180 meridian. Um, with a pen, and then interoperatively this serves to me as a reference to detect and to mark the axis of alineation of the lens. <clears throat> Let me tell you that I have found no particular benefit so far in the use of the sophisticated methods that are offered to the surgeon in order to, to detect the axis interoperatively with the Callisto and other methods probably because we don't, we, I'm not efficient on that, or probably because it's not as inaccurate to make the, the, the mark at the distance. And definitely, it's much cheaper and it's much more practical. What is true is that we have uh, a, an ideal toric lens that we should select. It, we, we should have a, a access to an unlimited correction of the cylinder. The lens should be stable in the back, not, uh, not rotating intraoperatively if possible, and definitely not possibly associated to the casual approach should be also with correct in asphericity and your surgery should be anastigmatic and this is part of your business. The smaller the incision, the better and indeed you have to work in a very good control incisional environment. <clears throat> Available models are here listed. You have lenses with uh, in fixed uh, toricity, and what you and, and they, they offer to you some powers, and this is what you have. And others that are listed here, in which you can customize the toricity, and they are they are very important for those of you who work with abnormal corneas, such as patients with keratoconus and cataract surgery, and especially if you are working with patients with trauma or after a uh, corneal grafting techniques. Let me show to you two lenses. Uh, one is the one that I probably prefer because of the outcomes, and the other is the one that probably I use more because of the availability. This is the, 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 the size 80 Comfort 646, which is a micro-incisional lens, micro lens that allows you to implant this lens through 1.6 to 1.8 millimeters, which is a remarkable issue, and indeed is the, the reason why I prefer it. It is a lens that is a plate haptic, uh, corrects the astigmatism in the positive meridian, and uh, offers to you the possibility to work with microincision. This lens has been evaluated by us, in a, and this report has been published. We uh, made an, a series of cases with a control group, and uh, we did, in all cases, the, the correct the surgery with microincisional surgery with the final incision never larger than 1.8 millimeters. And we analyzed the outcomes with the Alpins method, which, as you know, is a statistical software that really gives to you an enormous amount of information about what do you do with the correction of astigmatism. You have the the, the vector correction, the, the, the target vector, you have the surgical induced astigmatism detected separately from the astigmatism and you really know what you are doing. 
This is indeed an excellent way to do it. And let me tell you how I implant this lens. I use the on-axis um, implantation. I use a 1.8 millimeter incision. My incisions are one millimeter, but then I increase or I open on, the, on depending on the position if it is comfortable for me. And the 1.8 incision in the positive meridian, which is marked, and the lens is implanted in the casual back. This is microincisional surgery. I usually don't dilate my patients, but I use intraocular midratis because in this way I can control the surgery in a much better way. And I use a one, two, or three incisions depending on what I want to do. And the, I use the intraocular midriatic, and this is real time how the pupil is dilated. I, uh, I think that really to use intraocular midriatic is the way to, 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 to make something that depends on the nurse, to depends on your surgery, and it's a key point in cataract surgery uh, dilation. And then after microincisional cataract surgery, one millimeter, I use the same incision, it's increasing to 1.8 or to 1.6. Or I, did, I do a different incision if the location of the main portrait meridian is uncomfortable for my surgery and it doesn't matter to make three incisions. Finally, they are anastomatic, all of them. This is the way in which I'm loading the lens. And the lens is finally injected using the tunnel assisted technique, which is the one that I use because in this way you keep the, a, a lack of distortion on the incision and you control a, with a second hand the injection because otherwise your lens will not be injected a, inside the casual back. This is the way in which the distal haptic is implanted. The, the trial haptic is going to be pushed inside the casual back and certainly you need to rotate any a degree this lens because you implant in the axis where you want. The, to remove the viscoelastic, which is very important, doesn't make this lens to rotate, and it's an extremely nice, elegant lens to, to use with macro incisions in which rotation is not necessary, in which the, uh, the clean of the, of the viscoelastic is not affecting the position of the lens, and in this a remarkable lens, one definitely of my favorites. This is the way in which I use the surgery. And, uh, well, let me go now to the efficacy. This, uh, the Dercons were excellent, and actually, let me go to the summary. Okay, probably the characters are too small, but the percentage of success of a stimulation disorder was about 90%, 89%, and the, the percentage of a stimulation correct was 91%. That means that we did an excellent job, and this lens really did correct what we, what we wanted. Look here. Which is uh, the, the amount of stigmatism that we correct. We were talking about uh, the stigmatism with more than 2.5 diopters, and look that the mean was 4.54. We, we were dealing in this uh, paper with very uh, high stigmatism, and look that we did an excellent outcome on that. The mean, uh, uh, as you see, we, we, this was from where we, 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 we came and how we ended from minus 4.46 with the standard deviation 2.23, look at the mean and the very low standard deviation. We really got a, 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 a remarkable a, a outcome targeting exactly what we got. And the characteristic uh, changes were not significant because we were using microincisional carrier surgery. As you see here, we have the uh, difference vector of 0.47, so less than one degree, and we have the correcting index of 0.91, and the percentage of success, as I mentioned to you, was 89%. So this is the one and of the lenses of our choice because of the reason I have mentioned to you. They are published that and published in Trocula lens. This is the one that matches better with the others, at least based on evidence. This is indeed one of my favorites. The second, well, you, we have reproduced the same results with a toric model of bifocal and trifocal, which is the trifocal uh, size lens, in which the outcomes have been identical to the ones that we use in the monofocal toric. So let me go to you now to the lens that I use more. So the other is my favorite, and this is the lens I use more because availability is worldwide available, and second, usually the, the is cost effective, very good. The other lens is more expensive than average, which is the actus of Toric. The, this is well known by all of you. you we have a lens that has specific uh, haptics in order to make them stronger for the purpose of no, uh, not to allow rotation. It is provided from T3 to, T, to T9 in different powers. They are fixed powers. You cannot customize the lens. In size, you can order the lens of whatever power you, you, you want, up to 16 diopters. And the design is well known by you. It's an aspheric lens. And definitely, it's, it's a lens that provides very good outcomes. This is the information that comes from the literature, go, uh, basically, to the FDA study, in which they claim that they got a rotation after th three months of 3.75 uh, degrees. Uh, as you see from this study, most of the cases did less than a four uh, degrees of rotation, even that some did more. 
Uh, this is the, 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 the plotting, which you see how the, the, lens, the, the powers of the astigmatism are being matched by the in, the implantation of this lens in a very effective way, and we did our own study on it. This, is, this was our own study using the vector analysis by the uh, Azure uh, technology, and uh, we uh, got, as you see, or, or we analyzed cases of a, of a mean of 2.87 uh, diopters, as you can see here, and we uh, get a post-operative of 0.94. So we did a remarkable job as well, not as good probably as the, as the first one. Look that the standard deviation is slightly larger than we had in the previous study. This was the, this, the, the data, and you see here that we have a, a rotation of five degrees. This is important. This lens in our hands tends to rotate more, probably because C loop haptics will rotate any, in, in, in a way that is much easier because casual bar retraction ten, tends to make this lens to rotate. There is a slight tendency to work on the correction due to this, this trend, and the angle of error, excuse me for the mistake, was slightly more intense of the vector. So you have a lens which is quite effective. Uh, the, the ten, tends to under correct because of the rotation and the rotation in my hands was five degrees. Uh, so as a summary, I can tell you that we have the possibility to heal our patients, and with all my respect, I use in this slide just to, to farewell this talk. Indeed, toric lenses are my favorite method because of the precision, because I use micro incision or cataract surgery, because I can provide my patients with whatever correction from one diopter to 16 or more in very special cases, and finally, because they are cost effective. I am seldomly doing relaxing incisions. I do clear corneal opposite incisions up to one diopter, and I don't use laser uh, assisted femtosecond incision surgery. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Now, Francisco Carones will uh, defend one very important position, not easy to defend, which is LASIK postfaco. Francisco. Difficult to defend after your talk, especially. First of all, good morning, everybody, and I'd like to thank the organization for uh, this very nice invitation to be here and participate to this uh, exciting Congress. Um, you should go to the other presentation, the number one, not the moderator one, please. The one called uh, 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 LASIK uh, after FACO. Perfect, thank you. So, um, I was asked to discuss uh, the possibility of uh, doing uh, laser refractive surgery as an option uh, to correct uh, an amount of astigmatism uh, uh, in the event of cataract surgery. I want to just echo some of the things that uh, Jorge presented, uh, so how to correct astigmatism uh, when uh, at the time of cataract surgery. We can do a toric IOL implant at the time of surgery, we can do incisional surgery at the time of the cataract as well. This can be done with a femtosecond or manually. We can do incisional surgery after the cataract procedure, so at the second stage procedure. We can do laser vision correction after surgery as well. Or we can do also potentially a piggyback implant after the original procedure. And finally, we can use spectacles, but we don't want to use them. So basically, these are all the options that we have to correct astigmatism for a patient undergoing cataract surgery. Let me make some general consideration. Uh, as I said, these considerations are general. They're not addressed to all patients, but in most of the cases, uh, uh, an astigmatism, a pre-existing astigmatism higher than one diopter is likely to be corrected because patients uh, nowadays do not want to wear spectacles after surgery. So we have uh, a possibility to correct astigmatism and that is very welcome. In most of the cases, uh, performing a, surgery, a single surgical procedure is preferable for several reasons. Uh, so I echo what Jorge was saying, toric IOLs are certainly my best choice. Uh, uh, or you can do also incisional surgery at the time of cataract. In most of the cases also, uh, laser vision correction and uh, toric IOLs uh, are more accurate than incisional surgery. Having said this, uh, the 
my ideal procedure of choice to correct astigmatism at the time of cataract surgery is obviously a toric IOL. And I don't want to stay on that uh, because uh, Jorge explained very clearly what are the advantages of uh, this procedure compared to all the others. Uh, so uh, I just want to make clear and understandable that uh, I'm not doing LASIK on a routine basis uh, for correcting astigmatism. Uh, I'm doing uh, I'm implanting toric uh, uh, IOLs uh, in 99.9% uh, of the cases. But if we have to consider a second best option to correct astigmatism, uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> laser vision correction is more effective uh, and more accurate than incisional surgery. Um, it leads uh, to better visual performances. Uh, uh, it induces much less uh, fluctuation or variation of vision during the day or even long-term period. Uh, and it has a much better patient's acceptance uh, compared to uh, incisional surgery. The disadvantages of laser vision correction are uh, l a longer recovery time, mainly if we do uh, surface ablation, uh, and uh, higher associated costs uh, if we can co compare laser surgery to incisional surgery made uh, with uh, blades. Um, how can this procedure considered? Well, you may want to consider this as unplanned or unexpected because you have uh, a residual refractive offset, uh, either myopic, hyperopic, or astigmatic, uh, or because uh, with the surgery, you ended up inducing an astigmatism that was not uh, supposed to be induced. But you may also want to consider that uh, laser, vis laser vision correction after cataract surgery may be applied for, uh, uh, you know, in a planned fashion as a, a st established two-step procedure. And I'm going to talk uh, mostly about, uh, about, uh, about that. So there are specific cases, uh, like niche cases, uh, when you may want to, to do a planned uh, second stage uh, laser vision correction to fix astigmatism uh, after cataract surgery. And here are some examples. When you have an inconsistent preoperative astigmatism assessment uh, with a high discrepancy between the anterior and the posterior curvature, so you may, may, may be you know, confused about what's going on when implanting a, a toric IOL, you may want to consider this procedure when the two main axes are not orthogonal, so you have a skewed axis astigmatism, or when you have an asymmetric astigmatism as well as an irregular astigmatism. And I'm going to give you some examples. This is a nice image showing you the anterior and the posterior face of the cornea for a, a normal uh, astigmatism, uh, and, and you see in this case uh, la, how all the parameters are quite, uh, you know, uh, aligned. Uh, the anterior surface, the posterior surface bring the same amount of astigmatism, even though in the opposite direction, so everything is how it should be expected. But look at this case, for instance, uh, you see on the map uh, on your uh, right side that uh, the anterior and the posterior curvature bring uh, a different astigmat axis astigmatism which means that uh, you don't really know where the, where the final astigmatism is going to be. So in these cases, you may want to consider just waiting and uh, maybe doing a, a procedure later with a laser. Here is another example. You see a non-orthogonal astigmatism with the two, two main axes skewed. So we know that in these cases, uh, uh, toric IOS may not correct uh, adequately these uh, uh, situations. Uh, so in these cases, uh, you may want to plan for a secondary procedure at a second stage. Here is another example, an asymmetric astigmatism. Again, the toric IOL is not going to be able to compensate for this uh, uh, asymmetry in the astigmatism, as well as in this case, when you have uh, some irregular astigmatism generated by any reasons, uh, well, again, you, don't, you, you may not be very accurate in measuring astigmatism preoperatively, the corneal astigmatism, I mean. So these are cases where you may want to consider having a laser procedure at the second stage. So what are the strategies that you may want to apply in these cases? You can do like a conventional, wavefront optimized or spherical aberration free procedure, but in most of the cases, uh, the most accurate procedures that you may want to uh, apply are either corneal wavefront guided or, to or corneal total wavefront guided, because you want to fix uh, some irregular uh, situations. Here are the examples that I was giving you before. You, 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 you may clearly understand how uh, like a, a, a standard uh, aberration-free ablation 
cannot fix uh, astigmatism in these cases uh, because, going, because it's going to perform uh, like a regular shaped uh, ablation pattern, while in these cases uh, we need some uh, customized uh, approach. Um, when would you perform uh, this secondary procedure? In my practice, I have this uh, rule of thumb. I usually wait uh, at least, uh, and when I say at least, it means uh, at least uh, one month uh, for each uh, one millimeter of incision length. And this is for stabilization of the astigmatism purposes as well as for uh, sealing uh, of the incision. So if you have an incision two millimeters long, you may want to wait at least uh, two months. Uh, you have a 3.5, you, you, you may want to wait longer, obviously. Uh, how to perform uh, laser vision correction after cataract surgery? You may want to consider all the options like surface ablation, LASIK, uh, and maybe in future also uh, a smile or that kind of procedure. Surface ablation certainly has advantages. It's cost effective, more efficient than any other procedure. Uh, for older patients, uh, it may be preferable in terms of uh, the maintenance of the quality of the steer film compared to the other procedures. Uh, and uh, for sealing uh, uh, purposes, uh, it can be performed earlier than the other procedures. We know that this procedure is associated also to disadvantages uh, like pain and discomfort uh, as well as recovery time. Obviously, if you are facing a high amount of astigmatism to be corrected, uh, surface, surface ablation has been shown to be less accurate uh, as well. If we consider LASIK, uh, we are, obviously we have advantages, fast recovery and high patient acceptance compared to surface ablation. These advantages are mostly related to the dry eye symptoms that you may end up with uh, during the uh, post-operative period. I would favor also SMILE, especially in future, because of the advantages uh, that this procedure can have, uh, like a very fast recovery time uh, and very high patient acceptance uh, with uh, fewer dry eye symptoms compared to standard LASIK uh, or femtosecond assisted LASIK. Uh, uh, the disadvantages by now is that the accuracy of uh, like a pure astigmatic correction or a mixed uh, astigmatism correction is not possible to assess at all or is not possible to perform at all. And the other question is whether it, is po it will be possible in future to perform uh, wavefront, wavefront guided treatments uh, with this kind of technique. So, as to summarize, uh, the um, um, the, let's say the metropia target in uh, assessing astigmatism and correcting astigmatism at the time of cataract surgery involves, uh, in my experience and in my practice, uh, toric IOLs implant as the first choice. Uh, but uh, in some challenging cases as uh, irregular astigmatism, asymmetrical astigmatism with skewed asses, uh, well, a second option may be in those niche cases, as I said, uh, to plan the, uh, a two-step procedure with uh, laser vision correction. And uh, in terms of efficacy, quality of vision, and so, laser vision correction is certainly my best option uh, for the refractive surprises that we may still have uh, after cataract surgery. And in my practice, uh, what I'm doing by now is about 50% uh, surface ablation in these cases uh, and 50% femtolasic, uh, just because of the, and this choice is more, this choice is more uh, you know, related to the quality of the tear film or to the patient age uh, uh, at the time of the secondary procedure. Thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Very good. And now is the time of James Bacon. He will talk about limbal relaxing incisions. Then we shall make a, a vote after this just to know which are the incisions. Okay. Inviting me here today. Um, thank you for those excellent talks before my lecture today. Very interesting um, summaries of treating astigmatism. So I'm going to approach it more from the point of view of a cataract surgeon um, with some general principles and some general um, pointers to help you if you want to perform limbal relaxing incisions in your practice. Um, I also agree with the two previous speakers that for the majority of cases with astigmatism, I would perform a toric IOL insertion at the time of cataract surgery. So, as already mentioned, approximately 20 to 30 percent of patients have astigmatism greater than one diopter, um, and in these patients you would certainly consider treating them and getting rid of their astigmatism. It's relatively easy to correct at the time of their cataract surgery, and I would aim to correct patients with more than 0.75 diopters. 
it's particularly important, as also has been mentioned, when using multifocal intraocular lenses, because any residual astigmatism can affect the performance of the multifocal IOL. Um, and also, just to mention, with these different techniques we've mentioned, limbal relaxing incisions and also toric IOLs, they will rarely correct 100% of the astigmatism. And it's been quoted in the literature, approximately 60% of the magnitude of the astigmatism will be reduced with a limbal relaxing incision. Um, is that your experience, uh, Dr. Alio, or do you find more than that or less than that? Well, in my opinion, well, if I understood properly, you claim that 60% of the magnitude will be correct. I'm correcting more than 90%. About 90% this is what my data has shown to you. With, with an LRI? Yeah, we, we do it because we use uh, incisions that are anastigmatic, uh -huh. and part of the business is not to create your problem. You're creating problems if you use 2.75 incisions, you are going to change the astigmatic pattern of the cornea. So I don't think that you should use toric lenses if you, if you don't use at least 2.2 millimeters for inches. Okay, thank you very much. So just briefly on how to perform the um, surgery itself, you can see here some images. Um, the key thing is to stabilize the cornea uh, when you're performing the incision. You're using a diamond blade of a preset depth, uh, making incision in the peripheral cornea. The term is LRI, but actually that's a bit of a misnomer because you actually do it in the clear cornea itself approximately 0.5 millimeters from the limbus um, into the clear cornea. Um, these are preoperative marking, so you choose preoperatively how, how much you're going to um, cut in the cornea. And also here, and this is a way of, of marking the cornea. So with all these procedures, planning before the surgery is one of the most crucial steps. Um, and really you want to make sure that all the measures of the patient's astigmatism match and they all correlate. So you want to look at the uh, manifest refraction, um, the keratometry you've achieved with either a manual keratometry um, measurement or with um, topography um, or with auto refraction. So you want to make sure all these things tie up. And also, as mentioned before, we're looking at correcting corneal astigmatism here. So just the keratometric um, part of the patient's astigmatism because some astigmatism can arise, arise from the lens itself. The other thing to mention, particularly with LRIs and with toric IOLs, in the majority of cases, in the hands of a refractive, of a sort of cataract surgeon, as opposed to refractive surgeon, we're talking about regular astigmatism. So you can see here these two topographical images. Um, on the left is um, regular astigmatism in a with the rule fashion, and on the right, this is more indicative of keratoconus. So you wouldn't want to do this. Um, in a sort of blasé or a casual fashion if you're going to use LRIs in these patients, and I would refer them to a purely refractive surgeon for, for that. Also, you've got to bear in mind, because you're cutting into the, care, into the corneal tissue itself, the corneal thickness, which you measure with pachymetry to ensure you're not cutting too deep into the cornea, um, and these incisions can be done postoperatively, so it doesn't have to be done at the time of surgery. You can do it later if needs be. Contraindications to LRIs are cratoconus, as I already mentioned, um, autoimmune corneal disease, sig significant peripheral corneal disease, um, Terrian's marginal degeneration, and previous corneal surgery. Um, when you choose to do the LRI, you have to choose the depth um, in some cases and the, the length of the incision itself. And to do this, use what's called nomograms. Um, there are three main nomograms I'm aware of, the Donenfeld nomogram, um, the Napa nomogram, um, and also the Wallace nomogram. And these are useful for choosing your incisional um, length and depth prior to the surgery. Um, and these vary depending on the age of the patient, the amount of astigmatism, um, and also the position of the astigmatism or the axis. Um, so depending on those three features affects the actual LRI you perform. Um, because as a patient gets older, the corneal here will heal less because it's more, more brittle and more rigid, and so you have to adjust the length of the incision accordingly. So complications, as with any surgical procedure, there are always a risk of complications. Um, these can include under or over correction, um, infection following the surgery, um, penetrate perforation of the cornea, decreased corneal sensation because you're making an incision in the cornea, you're cutting the corneal nerves, so there's a risk for decreased um, sensation. Um, 
induced irregular astigmatism, which also was mentioned by Dr. Alio. Um, this is a key concern with LRIs um, and also discomfort following the surgery. So just to, to recap again, the surgery itself, you mark the patient with the eye, with the patient in a sitting position, because when the patient lies down, there will be rotation or um, intortion or extortion of the eye, which will affect your final outcome. Because most of the time, patients obviously are walking along, so they want to have their astigmatism corrected in the um, sitting position. You perform your LRIs prior to cataract extraction itself. Um, if you put viscoelastic on the cornea, it will help the movement of your blade across the cornea itself. It's important to hold the diamond knife perpendicular to the cornea, so as opposed to straight down towards the floor. It wants to be 90 degrees to the corneal surface. Um, and as I already mentioned, 0.5 millimeters inside the limbus. You pull the blade towards you when you perform the incision. So if you're sitting, um, you're sitting here, you want to pull the blade towards you to aid the um, incision itself. Um, and you can use post-operative non-steroidals to help with post-op discomfort. There are commercially available sets for performing these, these incisions. Um, this is a Wallace LRI set from Bausch & Lomb, which has got all the uh, components you need to perform this in your practice. Um, and also for further information, there are some good websites. So if you're starting off doing this yourself in your own practice, um, there are some good vid videos. And also Abbott produce an LRI calculator, which you can input your patient's data, um, and that will give you the incision length and help you with, uh, with your LRIs when you're doing them yourself. Um, so I think to summarize, I would say that LRIs possibly not as, as useful as they used to be in the, few, in the past before the advent of toric IOLs. Um, and I agree, in the majority of patients, I would use a toric IOL um, for patients. Thank you very much. The way to, sorry, thank you. The way to know how to, who is the preference. Look, you have the little machines to press. Okay, so after this session, could you raise your hands, those of you that are using at this moment toric intraocular lenses on a regular basis? Okay, how many of you use relaxing incisions? Okay, how many of us use two, the, these two techniques? Okay, so it seems that there's a minority that are, a, like me, using relaxing incisions or toric. My use of relaxing incisions up to one diopter. Let me tell you, I, I don't do relaxing incisions. I do opposite clear coronal incisions because they are more far away from the limbus. They, they, the trend to regress is much less, and I, I found them much more effective for this small astigmatism. Whether it's more than 1.5 is for toric. In between is the art of, the, of being a doctor. To be with the rule or against the rule, 0.5 makes a difference. And is the posterior surface of the cornea another issue? How many of you are including in your calculators the, the toricity of the posterior cornea surface in the calculations? Okay, not so many. This is, uh, has been, let's say, a sophistication. I have to tell you that we have in our calculator included this parameter, and it's very simple. It's the, to, to deduct or to add 0.5 diopters uh, in anything that is about, uh, more than one diopter of difference. You can, can go to the Koch Baylor's nomogram, and uh, my advice to you is use them. You gain about half a diopter, which is, in my opinion, significant for if you are dealing <coughs> with these cases, particularly with multifocal lenses. Any, any question or suggestion about this to topic? Yeah, that, that one question from the audience. Dry eye. Do agree? Well, they, they, in, in the, the states, uh, the Sama states that <clears throat> dry eye should be considered when performing a, 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 any type of incision. Sorry, the answer is absolutely yes. If you have a very dry eye, you are running into trouble. These patients will not heal. They are prone to infection, and definitely moderate dry eye. It might be doubtful. Severe dry eye is a clear contraindication. Slight dry eye in my hands is worse. Well, okay. Probably the level is grade one to two of Oxford classification. If you have more than point that one degree, one quadrant with punta keratopathy, you should not go definitely for relaxing incision. Uh, just a question: Did any uh, of you had uh, when you do first? Uh, 
Can you, if you do first the LRI and then do the surgery, have you ever uh, had a penetrated cornea just during the surgery? Because I had one. I did. Yeah, you, you can make a um, penetration with your LRI. Oh, like a rupture during the surgery. I've not had that myself, but I've, I've read about it. It is documented because obviously you're making a up to 90% depth incision. So that certainly is something that can happen. You have to be aware of that. Now, let me ask a question to the moderators who are very kind assisting me in this session. Uh, we have a statistics like, for instance, Andorra in the States, not a, 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 a bad surgery at all. And he claims that in his cases of uh, premium lenses, and they use accommodative, what they call accommodative, I don't think that they accommodate anyway, but in premium lenses, they have 22% of LASIK touch-ups. 22% is a lot, okay? So my question to you, which is the percentage of LASIK touch-ups that you have after a, a premium IULs, whatever astigmatism or, a, or any other, a Francesco? Well, now that we have a toric multifocal IULs, uh, that percentage dropped down. By now, it's about 2.5%. 2.2% 2, 2 about. Yeah. Okay. Bacon? Yeah, yeah I'd agree with less, less than 5% less than of patients will need post-operative um, correction of their stigmatism. Okay. Hesham? Uh, actually, I'm not doing refractive surgery, but what I refer for the refractive <coughs> surgery is less than 1%. So, because actually the toric IOLs has just like lots of uh, varieties right now. That, that's the point. In the States, they don't have a premium lenses with toricity. This is a problem. So if they use a multifocal, obviously use a cognitive, they have astigmatism. And astigmatism, according to my first and second slides, you should expect in Caucasian population about 20 to 30 percent, exactly the rate of touch-up. So since we have toric lenses, we are not in this problem. So look at what a huge difference. I, do, I don't like to make a LASIK or a PRK after my, my patients because simply I delay the, the, the follow-up. I duplicate the expense because of the, of the number of visits. And patients feel that something has failed. Don't you agree on this, Francesco, particularly? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, yeah. as, yeah. Was, as was I was telling before, uh, the, 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 the possibility of doing LASIK or any refractive procedure after uh, cataract surgery is just for niche cases uh, or in case of uh, refractive surprises, let's say. You mentioned that you use PRK. I do, so I totally agree. Which is, and you mentioned that about 50-50 you do LASIK or you do a PRK. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, for, those, for those patients, I'm saying. Okay, my, so my question is why you use LASIK in these cases? Because Good. usually you are dealing with small corrections they are very easily and very effectively treated by the LASIK. And usually, middle-aged elderly patients don't have the feeling about the cornea as much as young people, and the discomfort is not as much. The answer is because uh, um, I, I am doing uh, a significant number of uh, refractive LASIK exchange procedures, uh, and these are the patients where I prefer to do LASIK because they are younger, they are more active, they want to go back to work uh, earlier. So. So in your grade, do you prefer lamellar surgery than PRK? This, let's say this is only, only, only for younger patients, yes. <clears throat> Very good. Just okay. A, uh, one more addition that uh, we have another alternative, actually. There are the supplementary lenses, like, like one from Rainer, the Salcoflex lens. This can correct astigmatism, actually, for the patients who has not done toric contact lens. So if you have one lens and you have just can get the toric lens, plan of toric lens, and it can correct, put it in the sulcus, in the posterior chamber over the anterior chamber, like piggyback. And this is a lens that is shown that to be very sta stable. And I think we have the Asian here, so it's a, for Rainer, Salcoflex. Very good. Well, this is a very broad topic. We have been talking about regular astigmatism in normal patients. It's different if we talk about correction astigmatism in the patient with keratoconus or with coronary graft. You have refractive surprises, but this is not the session for this problem, but if you have an, an abnormal cornea, please be careful with the toricity. You need to use the posterior surface of the cornea. Otherwise, you can run into differences up to four diopters, but this is a different issue. Okay? Any last question? Because we shall move to the second part of this session. Yeah. The refractive surprise of the toric IOL is, in my hands, infrequent, <laughs> very infrequent. It happens because you have miscalculated or mismarked or something has been wrong during the surgery. The, the first reason, in my opinion, is that you lose the, the pupil size. 
because of the surgery. Uh, in this area of the world, ethnicity is uh, very pigmented, and this pigmented eyes reacts a lot to surgery sometimes. You implant the, the toric lens and you end with a small pupil and you don't know where is the axis. These are the reasons of, of the surprise in my hands. What I do is I redilate at the moment of the surgery with a, a, with a trocular midriatic and I implant and I choose the angle. If I see my patient to be wrong the next day, I wait a couple of days just for the cornea to stabilize, especially if any edema is present, and then I rotate. I very quickly rotate because otherwise you lose the chance. What would you do in refractive surprises? Same as you're doing, but the question that I would ask you, how many times, how many, what's the percentage of, of patients you have to rotate uh, back the IOL? L less than one in 200, probably. That, that's, the same, that's the same for me, yeah. It's very, very unlikely. Yeah, very, very rare. Okay, so let's move to the second part. Very exciting, of, let, let me tell you about uh, femtosecond assisted surgery. This is an uh, important debate. As you know, this is a technology that has been emerging in the last in about five years, I have been involved for about 10 years in this technology, I have my own opinions, and indeed what, problem, what this is a problem today is that leads you to a huge expense at the, and this cost should be balanced with the clinical error. So the purpose of this second part of this session is uh, uh, how is about a, a fentanyl cornea? Is this worthwhile? And uh, we have very distinguished speakers. The first will be Francesco Caronis again. Who, who, he will tell you fentanyl is a catastrophe. Is it needed? It's, it's a question that he will try to answer and to convince us. Thank you. And uh, good morning once more. Um, the question is very tough because uh, obviously technology is something that's very appealing uh, and uh, femtosecond uh, uh, laser assisted cataract procedures have become uh, quite popular at least uh, in Europe. But the question is, uh, is, is it really needed for the patient? Is it really needed for the surgeon? Is it really needed for the, let's say also for the, for the, for the business of the practice? Uh, uh, let's just focus on modern uh, traditional FECO surgery versus femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. We can summarize this as flax uh, to be easier. Modern cataract surgery is uh, fast, reliable, safe, uh, extremely accurate, uh, results are great. Uh, uh, it's difficult to think of uh, a more effective procedure in the, in the whole world of medicine. On the other hand, uh, uh, femtosecond assisted cataract surgery has uh, some potential advantages uh, uh, some potential disadvantages, uh, but the state of the art today is that uh, the uh, incisions are pretty much the same as uh, with uh, standard surgery. Uh, the capsulorexis uh, size uh, and uh, uh, positioning is quite accurate, although in, uh, under you know, expert hands uh, that could be the same also for standard FACO. And, uh, Certainly, nucleus fracture or, uh, uh, let's say, softening may bring advantages in terms of uh, the amount of ultrasounds we are going to use uh, when removing the lens from the eye, but is it going to really impact uh, the, the results uh, for the patients? So, to answer the question, if we really need uh, uh, flax, uh, I think there are four points that are to be discussed uh, th for different perspectives. Uh, first of all, the clinical outcomes. We are there doing surgery for patients' benefit. Uh, we have to look at the safety profile of a new procedure. We have uh, to deal today also with what patients want. Uh, and uh, finally, we want also to deal with uh, what can be efficient uh, from a business, uh, from a monetary point of view. Um, the outcomes uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, flax uh, are obviously good, but they are showing to be as good as uh, the ones uh, performed with the modern uh, traditional FICA surgery. Is uh, flax as a procedure bringing to better results? Uh, well, there are some assumptions like uh, that a centered uh, round capsulotomy may have a better IOL setting into the eye, so being more predictable in terms of uh, affecting lens positioning after the surgery. If that would be the case, uh, obviously this would mean having more eyes uh, on target in terms of refraction, as well as the incisions. If, and I'm saying again, if the incisions are more reproducible and repeatable, these may lead to better and more consistent uh, surgical induced uh, refractive cylinder, and so bringing us to have uh, uh, better outcomes. 
Unfortunately, today, there are basically no, not just a few, but no comparative studies. I mean, studies uh, analyzing patients, a series of patients treated simultaneously, compare the refractive results uh, of a femtosecond assistant versus a traditional FACO. So it's difficult to answer this question today. I mean, the question whether the results with flax can be better than traditional FACO. Let's see a safety profile. Uh, doing capsulotomy with uh, uh, a femtosecond is obviously easier, especially for those uh, learning surgeons. And there may be sur uh, cases uh, like uh, see exfoliation, xenolysis, uh, where the capsulotomy made uh, with the femtosecond uh, could be more reliable, more effective, more easy to perform, more centered uh, than usually. But these obviously are, again, some kind of niche cases, not all that we do on routine uh, practice, on routine days. As I said before, a lower amount of ultrasounds uh, when used to soften the, 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 the nucleus uh, may lead us to release less uh, ultrasound power during the surgery. But the bottom line is, again, that uh, first of all, there is a learning curve associated to the use of the femtosecond. And we know that use it during the learning curve, uh, there are more complications. So the safety profile of a procedure decreases compared to the, in this case, to the standard FACO procedure. And uh, most important, uh, there are, again, no comparative studies uh, evaluating safety profiles uh, on a simultaneous series of patients performed. So it's difficult as well to answer this question in a, in a purely objective and scientific way. Let's talk about uh, what patients want, because uh, nowadays uh, we as surgeons uh, are driven more and more by patients' willingness. And we know that patients love the idea of having a catheter performed uh, with a uh, with laser. In my practice, uh, when I ask the patients, uh, would you prefer laser or standard, uh, if, you, if you don't consider the economy, I mean, the, the monetary aspect, 99.9% uh, .9 of the patients would answer, oh, the laser, the laser is magic. So definitely, flax uh, is uh, well perceived by the patients, uh, and in terms of marketing, uh, is a very powerful tool that uh, we as uh, uh, practice, uh, practices have uh, in our hands uh, to uh, attract the patients. Let's also look at the uh, business plan and efficiency from a monetary aspect uh, of uh, flax. There are significant additional costs. And when I say significant, I'm not only referring to the cost uh, associated to the acquisition of the, of the femtosecond laser. I mean, each single procedure costs uh, quite a lot in terms of uh, disposables. Obviously, this means a premium fee that has to be reversed to the patients, uh, and uh, geographically speaking, in not all countries or not all geographical areas, it's possible to increase the fees uh, and not uh, having a drop uh, in the number of procedures. In terms of efficiency, there is no question about the fact that uh, a femtosecond laser-assisted procedure takes longer than a standard FACO. I, don't, I think this is not a question. You just have to take, keep, that you're, keep in mind that your routine is going to be slowed down by, by, by the femtosecond laser. So there is definitely slower patient flow in your, in your practice. If you're planning to do 10 surgeries in the morning with your standard cutter procedure, you're not going to plan to do the same amount in the same time period. And finally, as for all technology, there are some downs in terms of efficiency of the instrument, in terms of servicing or so, which may screw your daily practice as well. So the question if we really need flax uh, can be answered through this uh, originally question, original questions. Uh, so the clinical outcomes, uh, are they better with flax? Uh, still has to be proven. As well, the safety profile. Is the safety profile of flax uh, higher than uh, standard FACO classification? This still has to be proven. What about the patient's uh, experience and the, your marketing ability of uh, a laser procedure? Obviously, from that perspective, the answer for having a, a femtosecond is yes. And in terms of uh, your business plan, it all depends on your setup, your clinic, and the way that you're marketing your, your procedures. So I am using a femtosecond laser. Your question may be, so having said this, why are you using a femtosecond laser? Well, first of all, because it's not harmful. I'm having the same results uh, 
as traditional FECO. So it's not going worse, it's not going better, but it's not going worse than traditional FECO, at least in my hands. The same, the, the, the same is for safety. I mean, it's, it's a time burden, it's uh, something that slows us down, but in terms of safety, I don't see uh, less or more complications than my traditional FACO cases. In terms of uh, my experience in, with the patients and my marketing strategies, uh, my type of practice is a kind of high-end one. So in my hands, in my practice, in my setup, uh, the implementation of a femtosecond laser technology for this purpose, uh, and uh, I don't know why my slides are gone, uh, brought to some uh, you know, positive results uh, uh, and uh, the same is uh, for uh, uh, the business plan and the business model that we have. We increased our number of procedures, so we didn't make uh, significant more money, to, 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 to tell you the truth, uh, but we did not uh, lose money up to now as uh, compared to Startup FECO. So this is our, this is, can you go fast, one, one, go, 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 I'll, I'll do it. One more. Okay, so, so by now my, 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 my answer in terms of my practice is uh, I have some reasons to use uh, uh, a femtosecond technology uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a routine practice. It's not working any longer. Okay. So to answer quickly the question uh, if whether femtosecond laser assisted cataract technology is, is really needed, uh, my answer today is maybe. Even though it, my answer is maybe, I think it's worth uh, off uh, and uh, it will be more and more needed in future because uh, clinic outcomes uh, and safety profiles will improve. Uh, this is a still an early technology with great margin of that advancement. So we are at the same stage as uh, with phaco emulsification in 1985 when it was clinically launched. So lasers will be better tomorrow, results will be better tomorrow. We know about that. From a monetary and business perspective, uh, patients uh, are attracted by this technology. And uh, we know that uh, our practice uh, uh, performs uh, in terms of word of mouth uh, as the most. So as more patients will be out talking about uh, femtosecond laser technology assisted cataract kind of surgery, more patients will be asking of it. So we, it's important to be at, this, at, the, at the leading edge of, the, of this uh, uh, technology. And we know that uh, costs will decrease as for all the techno uh, new technologies. So business plans will be better in future and uh, will become more affordable. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. And now the second speaker will be Mohamed Hassan, a Foundation Assistant Cultural Surgery Managing Complications. Hassan, thank you. Um, actually, uh, what we promote the Lensex for, or whatever the Femme Second Assisted Cataract Surgery for, is just to get more, less complications. So my talk will be against this. Uh, hosp hopefully, um, the complication will come less, but actually it's much less right now from the uh, regular FACO. So we just have to say that Femme Second Laser aims to improve the safety and the accuracy of the procedure. And this is the future, actually, of the uh, cataract surgery. Either we like it or we don't like it. It's just like the intralase when it started and everybody said that the uh, manual keratome, uh, microkeratome is fine. Why do we do shift to the uh, Femme Second? It's just the same for the cataract. It will, the future will be for the Femme Second Laser. Uh, either we like it or we don't. It's still, still it's not 100% hazardous. Um, we have contraindications to avoid the uh, complications. We don't go to uh, cornea that is, has um, a problem if we, if we do some applanation with them. Um, and we, if there is any decimal dis seal, if there is corneal opacity, because this laser has to uh, penetrate through the cornea clear media. So if you have corneal opacity, usually we don't, we don't uh, use this kind of, uh, so it's not universal for every patient. Uh, if there's just like unclear media, like presence in the blood in the anterior chamber or flare or whatever that will prevent the penetration of the uh, laser in the, uh, in the eye, this will, uh, is a contraindication for the uh, lensex. Hypotony, glaucoma, um, and the presence of any corneal implant, this is another uh, contraindication. 
Um, if a patient, because we have to do capsule access and the patient has to be fully dilated uh, before, at least mid-dilated before the surgery, more than six millimeters. Otherwise, we cannot do capsule access, uh, that, um, which is the major advantage of the uh, lenses or the, uh, the uh, laser-assisted cataract surgery. In, if in a surgery we can dilate it with intracalibrary injection, but otherwise the patient should be really, and um, the thing is, the um, uh, phenylephrine should be used uh, routinely, and the, the other issue is that the pupil tend to constrict after the uh, lensing. So when you start doing the laser, and we go to the OR, usually we find that the pupil, especially if you're doing lots of surgery and you have some, like uh, 20 minutes between the surgery, you have uh, pupillary constriction. And this is a big problem usually, which we have to deal with later. So the conditions which would cause inadequate clearance between the uh, um, intended capsulot capsulotomy uh, depth and the endothelium, if the anterior chamber is very shallow, I think we should avoid the uh, laser. And I personally had one case that has uh, localized cornea decompensation because this lens with the anterior chamber, this was at the beginning of my practice. It, and I had a partial which cleared out, luckily enough, uh, in one month, but it, it made me a hard time. Um, if there's any uh, residual or recurrent active ocular or uh, eyelid disease, including any uh, corneal abnormality, for example, the recurrent corneal erosions, because this may recur, uh, or severe basement membrane uh, disease, it's better not to touch the cornea with, uh, with this um, uh, docking system of the intralase, of the, sorry, the femtosecond laser. Um, the, the other thing is some people has lots, especially in the beginning, we have, and in small eyes, we have uh, suction loss. Just like any refractive surgery, the suction loss happens, and when you try once or twice or three times, usually it doesn't uh, work out because the, co the conjunctiva will be edematous. So we may abort this, but luckily enough for us, for the cataract surgeon, is that you can just revert it to any uh, normal uh, cataract surgery, unlike the refractive surgeon. Um, other complications, you may have capsular tags, and this improved in the last uh, generations of the femtosecond laser. But in the beginning, when we had started with the first generation of Lensix, actually we had lots of, uh, of capsule attacks and we have to be very careful doing the capsule access as if we're doing manual capsule access. Uh, these tags may uh, rupture and even go to the, to the posterior chamber uh, if, if uh, we don't take care of them, of them uh, in the beginning. Uh, as we said, narrow pupil uh, uh, preventing the capsulosis is a, a, a complication. Uh, Applanation of the cone and firing laser can further reduce the diameter of the pupil. I said that before. Uh, the difficulties is the narrow uh, aperture. If we have narrow eye, uh, although some people say without speculum you can do this, but actually I tried without speculum. It was very difficult to dock uh, the uh, PI inside the eye without a speculum. But uh, narrow pupil, narrow uh, aperture is a problem that you, can, uh, you should avoid the patients with narrow uh, palpebral fissure. Uh, the patient who cannot lie on his back, just like kyphosis or scoliosis, uh, this procedure usually takes like two or three minutes, but docking by itself takes like uh, three minutes and uh, the application takes like one minute and some patients are really not comfortable uh, when they are lying on their back without any movement for, this kind, for five minutes. Uh, if a patient is claustrophobic, uh, theoretically he will not like something approaching him that much, but uh, this, this happens even for the cataract surgery, regular cataract surgery. So we have to have calm patient and uh, um, the patient should know that he shouldn't move at that time because suction may be lost at that time. Uh, oh, good enough, I hope this one will work. Anyway, so this is just a case of uh, the, the capsule, I don't know if you can see it or no. Um, and you can see here the difference between the cataract surgery, regular cataract surgery, and the lensic surgery. One of the things that you, the patient will notice is that the eye is very red. The eye is so red in the, in the lensics because of the suction. Unlike the cataract surgery, when we have white eye, 
This might be com com just considered as a drawback, but it's uh, usually this things goes within um, within uh, one week. The other thing is you may have problem in getting into the incisions that you might that you made with the uh, laser. Just like this patient, I did one. Actually, the primary uh, one did fine. The the side port, one of them, it's just very hard to go in. The other one went fine. But when we, I tried again the first one, it went. So you have sometimes we have to be persistent on, on doing the, uh, the incision. And uh, the other trick to avoid this is, is just to increase the, um, uh, the superior and inferior uh, limit of the laser to be uh, sure that we have the full thickness of the cornea. The other thing is you shouldn't, uh, if a patient has panas like preferred corneal opacity, I think this would be very difficult to have uh, incisions, so it's better to have manual incisions. Um, the, uh, this is another, um, another case of a very hard um, incision to be open. So just uh, manipulating the, um, the limit of the, of the uh, incision, this will help, and this comes with experience. Um, there are, have been some studies uh, about um, the complications of the, uh, of the lensics. This study was done in Australia and found out, especially in the first 200 patients, uh, and we'll compare it to the later on with 1,000 patients, that 2.5 had suction loss, 10% has anterior capsular tags, 7.5% uh, had anterior and posterior capsular uh, tears, 2% uh, has a posterior lens dislocation. Uh, this is the most important posterior. We have to be very careful in uh, high good section with, with this um, uh, procedure because the hydro section is actually very dangerous, and this one uh, can lead to posterior capsular, uh, posterior lenticular, uh, drop in the vitreous. The mean number of the uh, docking was in this uh, study was 1.5 per eye. This is, remember, this 1.5 per eye in the first uh, 200 patients. In the consecutive uh, 1,300 patients, the, the uh, complication went less. Like, like this, the mean number of docking went, went down to 1%, 1.05%. It means that it was successful nearly in every patient. 1.23% uh, had uh, constricted pupil. 1.92% uh, uh, required manually uh, created corneal incision. So in conclusion, the complication can still occur. Uh, it gets less with experience. Choosing the right patient is a very uh, vital uh, for the uh, success, uh, success of the surgery. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. And now the next speaker, Ahmed Asaf, will deal also with complications. So it seems to be that is the main concern, how to make complications not to happen and how to avoid them. Thank you. May I have my presentation, please? Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for their invitation, uh, especially Dr. Temer Usama Gamali and Dr. Mijam Ali. My talk will concern about the, uh, how to avoid complications of the femtosecond cataract surgery. Can you bring me the first slide? No, first, sli first slide, please. It was in the first slide. You can stop, yes. Up, up. First slide. First slide. Still, yes, up. Yes, this one. Okay. Well, as you know that the femtosecond cataract surgery, like any other surgery, has its unique complication. And uh, it's the fair, uh, transition surgeon needs to recognize those complications and try to avoid them in the first place. So 
In literature, you can find that there are several complications related to the fem 2 second laser assisted cataract surgery. And you can see that here we have incomplete capsulotomy, anterior capsular tag, anterior capsular tear, and posterior capsular tear. And it won't make you too much time that those complications are almost related together and related to the incomplete capsulotomy occurrence. So the first step to avoid uh, complication with the fem 2 second laser assisted cataract surgery is to avoid the incomplete capsulotomy, the occurrence of the incomplete capsulotomy. So there are some tricks to avoid incomplete capsulotomy because there are some factors here you have to consider to avoid incomplete capsulotomy during flax. First, we have the patient selection. We have the prevention of meiosis during the surgery, ensure corneal clarity, identify eye movement, and some other laser factors. First of all, we have to select patients and avoid patients with individual deep set eyes or high brow because those patients are likely will get some suction loss with them. And uh, you have to make sure that the patient can still uh, uh, lie flat, as mentioned by Dr. Hisham Ali, and uh, remain still for a while. And uh, to minimize the eye tilt during the docking process because the eye tilt is associated with aberrant laser firing and a higher incidence with suction loss. Uh, Of course, we have to prevent meiosis, as mentioned previously, because the laser firing will induce some of the prostaglandins released inside the anterior chamber, and this will induce meiosis. So it's better to implement topical non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Just one hour, two drops, one hour before the procedure will minimize the occurrence of this complication. And it's better, to, of course, to bring your patient as quickly as possible to the uh, operating room uh, uh, to avoid the uh, uh, complication, probably within 15 minutes uh, of the uh, uh, procedure. And ensure, of course, cornea clarity. We have to uh, make, clear, make sure that the cornea is clear and avoid uh, patients with the basement membrane dystrophy because these opacities might interfere with the uh, laser pathway during the uh, uh, firing in the anterior chamber. Uh, we have to avoid, uh, can you play the video, please, this one on the, the right side? Just click on the video, please. Actually, this is not the presentation. This is not the final version of the presentation. Just click on the video, please. Yes. Uh, during docking, because they, we have to watch for the eye moving during docking here. You can see that the patient during docking might move his eyes while the system is still running on. You can see here now the patient moved, but still the system is calibrating and measuring the intraocular structure. So we have to be careful about this. And once noticed by the surgeon, we have to stop and rescan again because this is misleading to the machine and may uh, result in wrong calculation of the intraocular dimensions and results in aberrant laser firing and incomplete capsulotomy. And we have to make sure that we have to understand uh, how femtosecond laser works, because femtosecond laser works uh, by uh, photodisruption. It works like a knife, and that's why we, uh, we term the capsulorexis not anymore capsulorexis, it's capsulotomy. And as long as the femtosecond laser pulses are uh, uh, overlapped together, we will get a smooth uh, capsulotomy without any tags, with smooth edges of the capsulotomy without any tags. But Sometimes, as you can see here, this animation, this is the, how the laser works for the capsulotomy. But if the laser tags, sometimes the laser um, spots are not overlapped together, and you can get uh, uh, not smooth as smooth capsulotomy edges like with the, uh, as we used to have with the, femtos, with the uh, capsular axis, you can find that the capsulotomy edges is uh, ragged. Uh, with some jagged uh, edges and small focal uh, uh, points or tags uh, similar to poster stamp appearance. As you can see here in this uh, slide, you can see this is poster stamp because the uh, capsulotomy uh, edges is not smooth anymore. Now, because the capsulotomy, the laser firing is not overlapped together and they are aberrant. Why this happened? You can see here another uh, movie over the scanning electron microscopy. You can see that uh, there are some two rows of laser firing, and the two rows are separated by about 15 microns. 
Uh, and you can see this is a higher magnification of the same patient because of the micro saccadic eye movement during the laser firing. This phenomenon occurs, and it's better to avoid this micro saccadic eye movement. So, it's, uh, uh, according to one paper, the, this micro movement of the eye considered about 20 microns during 1.5 seconds, the, the time needed to perform capsulotomy. You can see here, this is 15 microns, which is attributable probably, most probably, to the micro movement of the eye during the capsulotomy, during the firing process, the laser firing for the capsulotomy. So the faster the platform of the laser machines, the better results, and you will get uh, consistent capsulotomy with the faster machines. And of course, we, original anesthesia sometimes might be necessary for some patients to block this eye movement in some patients. I used to do topical anesthesia, but sometimes I have to refer to the original anesthesia in some patients that are difficult to control uh, their eye, eye movement and difficult, difficult to fix during the laser firing. And of course, you have to avoid the platform that will induce too much uh, corneal aplanation because the corneal aplanation will uh, cause some corneal folds, and these corneal folds will interfere with the laser pathway and results in aberrant laser firing and it results in incom incomplete capsulotomy. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is the less aplanating, of course. Okay. Excuse me, can, can, can you run the final presentation? IT, please. Can you stop this one and run the final version? It's termed final because this is not the presentation I'd like. Can run the, you can run this one. No, this is the PowerPoint version. I mean the, the keynote version. Let me try to summarize a little bit. Yes. Okay. Yes, the, the keynote, the, the keynote that is above, yes, this one. Yes. Yeah, now skip, now skip slides. Skip again, please. Again, again. This, uh, the next one, yes, play, please. And we have to uh, consider again the, the laser firing, the laser uh, the spot size, because we have to use the smaller spot size. Smaller spot size is associated with the smoother edges in comparison to the higher injury uh, laser platform. So we have to skip this one. And there are some interoperative considerations. We have to prevent meiosis, as mentioned before. I will skip this one. And of course, we have to inspect capsulotomy. Use higher magnification of the microscope uh, to, if you, if you found this phenomenon that the capsulotomy button is retracted to one side of the opening, suspect some tags here, and we have to be careful while dealing with these tags. And, avoid, and you can use some OVDs to clear the uh, uh, gas bubbles. To, it will provide clearer view for you and to deal with the uh, missing uh, tags, as you can see here in this movie. Just find movement with the capsulotomy forceps, and you can get rid of the capsulotomy uh, button safely without making any complication. And uh, careful hydro dissection, it's some uh, so small, controlled, multiple location hydro dissection, just only to, to, to provide the passage for the gas bubble that trapped underneath the nucleus to escape to the anterior chamber. It's not to mean to hydro dissect the nucleus, rather to, to provide a conduit for the air bubble to escape from the underneath the nucleus. And finally, it try to split the nucleus, taking the advantage of the pre-performed laser cuts. It will release the uh, gas still uh, entrapped underneath the nucleus, uh, which may jeopardize the posterior capsule during the phacomulsification process. So, final words that complication of the flax occurs in the first place because of the surgeon does not recognize the complication. And the surgeon, we have to uh, avoid complication by recognizing this complication and to comply our surgical technique in the first, uh, uh, to modify my, our, our surgical technique to, uh, according to this complication. And because of the software and hardware improvement together with the uh, experience built up, the instance of this complication might be getting less down. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And both speakers have failed to mention the main complication of intersecond, which are the financial complications. Because this is the problem, this is a technology that if you go to the recent evidence published, at this moment is not adding any particular value at all to our practice. This is true. 
Second, it is a promise, and for sure, in the future, we shall deal with lasers for this type of solid. Probably this is one of the lasers, but not the only one. But the main problem is how to put this into practice. And just two weeks ago, in London, there was a, a meeting on this topic, and it was demonstrated by Murfield's a hospital that you need 800 cases per year not to lose money. Not to lose money, 800 cases a year. So my question to both speakers, have you considered the financial complications as the main one that probably you are running your institutions with this device? The other complication is the time. It's, uh, you, you take more time in doing this kind of surgery rather than if you have busy list. Actually, this may be a uh, time loss for you. This is time loss and this money loss if you're doing. Uh, so this is uh, the, the big complication, actually. The, com the, this um, financial is a complicated for the patient, not for the surgeon. Yeah. Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Hassaf, <clears throat> how are you dealing with the financial complications? Well, uh, I used to, to give the patient uh, two options, either, either to, to do it in manual fecal emulsification or the uh, femtosecond laser uh, uh, surgery. And the patient, of course, will pay out of pocket. Still, um, about 90% of my cases is the manual fecal emulsification for the financial issues. And just 10% of the patient agreed to pay extra out of pocket just to do with the uh, femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. So uh, it's still in infancy, but I, 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 I believe that according to Francesco Caron said, uh, uh, prices will getting down by, by the improvement of the technology and the mass production of the machine. Thank you. I think that Dr. Nasuri wants to make a point. Yeah, uh, Jorge, I, maybe I'd like to disagree with the, with the speakers because, uh, you know, the patient always is ready to pay a little bit more the difference between conventional FECO and femto FECO is not that big. They pay much more for multifocal IOL. The difference between procedures is not that big. Uh, regarding the time, uh, you know, it depends on the practice. If you have, imagine if you have five or six surgeons doing FECO at the same time in, in, in three or four operating rooms, and then the fellows or the younger surgeons are doing the rexes, and the, I mean, the capsulotomy and the incisions for them, and then just feeding the operating rooms with the, with the, uh, uh, with the patients, I think it will be saving time. This, this, we said the same about the femto LASIK as opposed to conventional LASIK uh, maybe 15 years ago, and now the femto laser is, is saving time rather than the losing time. And I think the, with, the, with the cataract surgery to be the same with the same experience, this, this technology is evolving, and I think in the very near future we'll have a big shift toward the femto cataract uh, surgery. Well, this might be true. You know, this is, in my opinion, this is a trend, but um, to, we, we did the calculations, and you need to charge at least 700 euros per eye doing 30 cases a month if you don't want to lose money. This is our data. And the second problem is that uh, if we give an informed consent and the patient has to it has to be informed, we cannot really say, based on, on evidence, that we are offering any particular advantage. And at least in Spain, people are not attracted by technology, people are attracted by the doctor. And they, they think that you are doing the, the, what is necessary for them. So we haven't found to be a marketing tool, femtosecond, number one. Number two, we haven't been able to convince the patients for the, to pay so much money for something that they definitely will feel. And definitely there is a niche market that is about 2% of the patients that are really, they want to be in, on technology, but this is only 2%. And I wonder whether this is enough to create our financial model. This is the problem. Okay, any other comment on femtosecond? This topic will be every year different and of course will be evolving. I think that we are in time. We started 15 minutes later. And I want to thank the organization and the speakers for this very nice session and for the comments. Thank you very much. And now, Dr. Damal Gameli is going to make a point on a special note dealing with this uh, meeting. Please, uh, just one note, uh, all the speakers, all the delegates, can you pass by the uh, registration again to take the voting pads? Because it was starting early in the session, so we didn't have the, the voting pads. 
So please take your voting card. Thank you.